Hi, Kendall. Hello. Um, Sorry, I'm just coming out of another class. Yes. And, uh, <laughs> you know, it's so it's slightly perverse uh, because we're doing everything from our computers. Those of us who are teaching remotely, we don't really program um, the time between things. Uh, so I'm I'm still a little discombobulated, but it's very nice to see you all and to see my dear friend, uh, Professor Kurgan, whom I've never. This is this is our baptism by Zoom because. <laughs> Well, we've been on Zoom before. We did Passover on Zoom, but this is our first time at Columbia or at, at, on, on our digital campus together. So I'm delighted to be here with you. Thanks for inviting me. No, thank you for coming. We're mm -hmm. very excited. Uh, we met you during the uh, CGC Rio event and we're super excited to have you. And then Great. just to uh, give you a little brief that uh, Ragnar is gonna present first and then Felipe, and then you can go third and then Lauder is gonna open up for the round table. Great. Yes, I'm gonna start sharing the screen so we can start the event. Can everyone see my screen? Mm -hmm. Great. So good evening, everyone, and thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Alice. I'm a third year student in the Master uh, of Architecture program degree at Columbia University. Um, and I'm originally from Sao Paulo, Brazil, and one of the co-directors of Latin GSAP. Latin GSAP is an interdisciplinary student organization in the Columbia's Graduate School of Architecture, Planning, and Preservation dedicated to the promotion, discussion, and reflection of contemporary issues and ideas in Latin America. The overarching theme selected by Latin DSEP for the semester is alterity. Alterity refers to the acknowledgement of the existence of oneself through the capacity to recognize the other as such, a singular subjective person. Alterity is a essential process to achieve empathy, the capacity to put ourselves in someone else's shoes. If we cannot see the other, we cannot respect them. Or if we can only see the other as a negation of oneself, we cannot relate. This semester, Latin GSAP is working on a variety of projects related to the theme of alterity. As we speak, we are launching the call for submission for our new publication titled Patio. Patio welcomes submission from all creators with a focus in Latin America subjects. We invite you to submit any project, provocation, interview, or imagination that you have created that addresses the theme of authority in Latin American context. For information and, uh, about submission and guidelines, please check the PIDO's website and Instagram. The links will also be in the Zoom chat. So uh, Latin Jesus conversation series will continue to explore the umbrella theme of authority after tonight's event as well. Our next events include Urban Fabric and Scale on November 10th, and our keynote event on Alterity and the Third Landscape on December 1st. The events in the conversation series are co-created with Professor Anna Dietz, co-sponsored by GSAP and the Institute of Latin American Studies, and supported by Columbia Global Center Rio and Santiago. So tonight, Latin GSAP would like to welcome you and all the panelists. Dr. Ragnar Ramos, Felipe Correa, Dr. Kendall Thomas, as well as moderator Laura Kurgan to Mapping and Authorship. Tonight's event aims to bring forth the question of mapping as a tool to define and redefine landscapes that expose the concerns, priorities, and values of the author and the society around them. This exercise of recognition to define the other informs the construction of place and space, creating implications on the Latin community in Latin America and the United States. On this note, I would like to invite Professor Anna Dietz to introduce tonight's panelists. I think you're muted, Professor Dietz. Sorry for that. Um, so I was thanking everyone for being here and um, thanking, especially thanking the panelists, um, you know, for their time and for their wisdom. Um, 
this event is, is, I can say, I think a direct result of the powerful movement that happened um, in our streets um, this summer. And it was very interesting and very, um, very good to talk to the students about all of these issues and then to see them act upon them. Um, this word alterity is so um, powerful and it's interesting enough, a word that I don't think Americans use a lot. So I'm very curious to see um, the discussions that we're gonna have around it. Um, our first speaker um, is going to be Dr. Wagner Hamus. Um, Dr. Hamus is an associate professor at the University of Puerto Rico. He is the author of the book, Queer Sites in Global Contexts, Technologies, Spaces and Otherness, which showcases a variety of cross-cultural perspectives that foreground the physical and online experiences of LGBTQ people living in a variety of places in the world. His doctoral um, thesis, Spatial Practices, Digital Traces, uses GPS apps as a lens through which he can analyze how users construct alternative embodiments and spatial relations. Um, is that right, Hagenis? Our second, <laughs> our second panelist, Felipe I'm Correa. trying to unmute myself is a founder and managing partner of Somatic Collaborative. He is currently professor and chair of the Department of Architecture at the University of Virginia. And prior to joining UVA, Professor Correa was associate professor and director of the urban design degree program at Harvard University Graduate School of Design. His most recent book, Sao Paulo, a graphic biography, released in 2018, is a bilingual edition that traces the history of the city's urban form. Um, and then finally, we'll have um, Dr. Kendall Thomas, um, Laura's friend. He is a Nash professor of law at Columbia University and scholar of comparative constitutional law and human rights. Dr. Thomas is the co-founder and director of the Center for the Study of Law and Culture at Columbia Law School where he leads interdisciplinary projects and programs that explore how law operates as one of the principal makers of meaning in society. He is a founder of Amend the 13th, a movement to amend the US constitution to end enforced prison labor. And then joining um, the speakers, we have Professor Laura Kurgan to moderate our discussion later. Um, Professor. Kurgan is a professor of architecture at Columbia GSAP and author of Close Up at a Distance, Mapping Technology and Politics. As director of the Center for Spatial Research, she has used mapping as well as data visualization, collection and analysis to create, and here I quote her, a critical reflection on the limits and ideologies of both data and its representation. So um, I think we can begin with um, Hagnet. Can you see my screen? Yes. Well, thank you for the introduction, Anna, and thank you, Latin GSAP, for inviting me to talk tonight. And hello to everyone who's joining us. I've seen. Some of my family members and students are here, so that's pretty cool. My name is Regner. Um, on Instagram, I'm regner.xyz. If you wanna know more about my work, I'm gonna to try to go really, really fast so you don't have a lot of time. So I just wanna put these three books out there, which are three really important books that really inform my work. The first one is Samuel Delaney's book, Times Square Red, Times Square Blue. The second one is Sight Writing, The Architecture of Art Criticism by Jane Rendell. And the third one is San Juan Gay, Conquista de un Espacio Urbano de 1948-1991 from a Puerto Rican historian, um, Javier Laureano. And they really helped me think about the work of how I can tackle issues of architecture and queerness from a Caribbean context in Puerto Rico, where there's very, very little that's been done or mapped out. Um, so through my work, I look for different ways to think about architecture and the politics of space with, against, from, through, across, and towards queerness. 
this use of preposition is intentional and it's something that I borrow from Samuel Delaney and Jane Rendell. Um, and I do this through different ways. Primarily my research methods are site specific events, writing, drawing, making, and most recently cartography or my attempt at cartography. I am by no means an expert and I'm trying to find my way around it. So I thought that I would just kind of introduce you briefly to my work to let you know how it's unraveled and where it's at now. So the first thing that I wanna mention is El Site, which is where I do my writing and where I put all my research. It's a performative writing tool, but it's also really helpful um, to keep my research updated all the time. The other one is Lost Sites, which is my latest exhibition that I did here at the University of Puerto Rico. And this was funded by the Fondos Institucionales para la Investigación. And I want to show that so that I can explain how I've gotten to Queertopia, which is my recent project, which has just been awarded funding this term for the next two years. So it's in diaper stage. And this conversation, I'm hoping, will really help me think about the material that I am going to be tackling for the next two years. So I want to introduce you to my website. It, this is El Site. It's um, my research method, as I mentioned, and it, it, everything that I put here is a mix of writing, queer events, exhibitions I've done, um, ongoing research projects, and I just want to briefly go through the work that I did with Lost Sites, which is the exhibition that I mentioned. Um, I think we're still seeing your PDF, Doctor. Sorry to interrupt. Oh, sorry. Now? Yes. All right. So this is my last research project that I had in 2017 to 2019. And what I was setting out to do was to map out spaces where the LGBTQ community in Puerto Rico gathered. Um, so I did these series of maps and they were based off the US quadrangles, the US topo maps. And I drew them up locating not exactly the precise building, but the areas that were um, being appropriated by the queer community. And as I drew them up on an AutoCAD map, I was also thinking about them in three dimensional form. So I was putting together this compilation of maps axonometrics and models, as well as you can see here, some projections of the buildings from the outside. There's really been nothing done in Puerto Rico to document these spaces and, and the spaces of the LGBT community, apart from this book that I mentioned, which is Javier Lariano's book, but his book only documents from 1948 until 1991. So I'm trying to follow in, in the, where he left off and really address it from an architectural standpoint, which is something that's really, really behind in the island. So part of what I'm trying to do is to queer the process of, of model making itself, um, creating these colorful kind of archipelagos that are kind of informed also by the archipelagic studies field. Here I post all my events so that I'm very interactive on social media, for instance. So this is where I pinpoint everybody. I think that's also part of my research method, engaging with people who, who are interested in my work. From this project in particular, what I started to notice when I started doing these maps right here, these orange ones, was that some of the conditions of Puerto Rican queer spaces, and I, I say the word queer as this huge, immense umbrella of possible um, non-normative identities is that once you print out these maps, they become outdated almost immediately because the queer community here is so active that a lot of these spaces get borrowed for a particular night of the year or a particular night of the week or a particular night of a month. And so the space itself isn't necessarily an LGBTQ owned venue, but rather an appropriated space that's lent by the bar owners usually to peak um, bar sales on off nights. So also one thing that's been happening, especially after Hurricane Maria in 2017, and most recently because of COVID, 
is that a lot of the spaces that we do have that are properly LGBTQ spaces have closed. So we've been in a recession for, I don't even know how, how long it's been. And the hurricane only made it worse. It really destabilized the economy. It made people leave the island because there were there was job opportunities. And because of COVID, most of these places haven't really opened. So the act of mapping is only makes sense if it's digital. So I was thinking about this new project, Queertopia, and what possibilities I had to translate these maps and think about them as artifacts that have that. A lot of people think that they are really ob objective and they present harsh truth, but really they're very carefully curated and they actually exclude a lot of information. What I partially argue is how they've excluded the LGBTQ, LGBTQ community in Puerto Rico. Um, so I've been thinking about what kind of information these maps will present. And I think I'm quite early to this conversation because we've only just started thinking about what this map is going to do and what it's gonna be used for. Um, and I'm sure that I'll have more to share in the coming months, but it's still under design. But basically this proposal, what I'm doing with Queertopia is creating a web-based interactive map that acts as the first architectural and urban register of LGBTQ plus spaces in Puerto Rico. And I'm gonna be trying to do that from the 1960s until today. So what I'm saying is that by recognizing spaces of queerness within car contemporary cartographic practices, Queertopia, which is the name of the map, um, inserts the buildings and spaces that are significant to the Puerto Rican LGBTQ plus community into the island's architectural history, into its cultural infrastructure, into its urban memory, and it's hopefully its political future. So the map, the way that I foresee it is that it's both an archival artifact where users can input data, but also a speculative research method and that I'll be able to test innovative approaches between the ur between urban studies and socially oriented GIS technologies. Um, so what I want people to be able to do is to interact with map and let us know about the spaces that we don't know. Um, and part some of the questions that I'm wondering is how can digital mapping help generate knowledge about queer histories and spaces and practices in Puerto Rico? And can this map suggest new ways of thinking about the island's built environment? Um, we're, we've also been having a lot of hate crimes le lately in Puerto Rico, where many trans women have been have been murdered. And I'm wondering how this queer map can be used to empower the and protect our community. Um, I think there's a, a huge problem when we think that LGBTQ plus spaces in Puerto Rico have been excluded from the very representations of space and from architectural discourse almost entirely. So what I'm trying to do with Queertopia is to consider the act of mapping as a political act in itself. And it's a reclaiming of space uh, in the search for equality and the right to the city. So in that way, Queertopia aims to be a historical register, a contemporary resource, and a future tool for advocating for LGBTQ plus civil rights and democratic inclusion. Thank you so much, Ragnar. Uh, we're gonna follow up with Felipe Correa's presentation. All right, good evening, everyone. Uh, very, very happy uh, to be here. Uh, and before I start my presentation, of course, a huge thank you uh, to uh, Latin GSEP uh, for organizing this event uh, and to my co-panelists and uh, uh, to uh, Laura for moderating, uh, for moderating this. Uh, I was given uh, a host disabled Participant screen sharing. No. So you should be good to go, I'm, Professor. I'm good to go. Thank you. Um, can you see my screen? Yes. Yep, perfect. So uh, um, I was uh, told I should speak for five minutes. So uh, I have condensed uh, a lecture that's uh, generally an hour to uh, uh, five minutes. So I'm gonna try my best, but it might be seven. Um, so uh, I'm gonna speak uh, briefly today uh, about this project that we just finished uh, uh, called Sao Paulo, a graphic biography. Uh, but before I actually go into the specifics of the project, I would just like to introduce uh, sort of through one slide, sort of the model through which sort of uh, it, 
my body of work uh, has developed over time. Uh, and for us, it, both in the office through Somatic Collaborative as uh, uh, well as uh, sort of through teaching uh, at the University of Virginia, uh, it is very important uh, sort of that we develop a body of work that is iterative and that actually is explored through many different avenues. And in that context, sort of uh, my work oscillates between sort of design pedagogy, larger applied research projects uh, where we ask sort of larger questions on a longer time frame. Uh, and sort of the immediacy of professional practice. Uh, and for me, it is the dialogue between uh, these two conditions uh, that becomes uh, uh, extremely important. Uh, and our portfolio, specifically in the office, oscillates between 50% sort of design commissions, 50% these larger sort of research project uh, commissions. And it is it, within these larger research project commissions where the idea of mapping, a, or more importantly, drawing the city uh, becomes extremely important for us. Uh, for us, by drawing the city, by drawing it, we edit it. Uh, by editing, we can interpret, and by interpreting, we can transform territories. And this is a process that for us is uh, uh, extremely important. Uh, and within this context, of about two or three years, three, uh, three and a half years ago, uh, uh, we were actually approached uh, by the Haddad Foundation to develop a larger vision plan for the Arco Tiete uh, and to rethink the transformation of post-industrial land between the city center and the Tiete River. Uh, and this for us was a fascinating task because of all the cities in the world, Sao Paulo has the largest amount of inner city post-industrial land. There's no other city with more square uh, kilometers of uh, uh, post-industrial land. Uh, on the one hand. On the other hand, it is heavily disconnected from the city center. So uh, in terms of our initial task, sort of our project actually revolved around sort of the transformation, uh, around giving a new identity to the post-industrial. The issue with post-industrial is that it's always based on what it was and not what it should be, right? It's always defined based on its historical use. And for us, it was important to begin to think about this area in terms of a new inner city district for affordable housing that could only happen through the negotiation of the through, sort of through the rescaling of mobility infrastructure, the reimagining of a larger hydrological project for the area, and then the reorganization of block structures in relationship to new uses. Uh, and this was sort of the task or the mission of the project. But for us, looking at Sao Paulo was for sure a much more expansive uh, and ambitious task. Uh, and for me, it was specifically uh, important to develop a body of work, a graphic biography that would help us understand how a city that it, in uh, 1842 had 20,000 inhabitants, today is a metro region that has more than 25 million inhabitants, depending on how you count. And what is the larger history of its urban form? If you go into a, a, a bibliography of Sao Paulo, you find thousands of books. But until we produced this book, there was not a single book that would tell you its history through the lens of urban form. Uh, and for us, that was extremely, uh, extremely important. Specifically understanding Sao Paulo's relationship to its larger sort of territory uh, and sort of understanding that its history is, is, is sort of strictly tied to a much larger territorial project, which was actually the transformation of the lower Paraná River into a hydroelectric Eden, a project modeled after the TVA, which provided a steady source of energy that created sort of the security for investors to turn Sao Paulo into the industrial capital of Latin America. Uh, and then of course, it's transition from industrial capital to a service economy. Uh, if uh, the state of Sao Paulo would be a country, it would be the third largest economy in Latin America after Brazil and Mexico. So the first part of uh, uh, the book, which is what I'll focus in the next couple of slides, primarily looks at the history of Sao Paulo, not as a city that was a center, but as a city that, was, that grew as a node between the Port of Santos and the larger sort of hinterland uh, and interior. 
uh, and the larger sort of complexity of geometries and geographies that sort of evolve uh, from this larger sort of regional connection uh, east-west. And equally as important, the urban projects that have actually shaped it over time. One of my favorite spaces in the city, the Centro Cultural Sao Paulo, a great cultural center that's built by giving value to residual land that sits between a highway, a street, and above the air rights of the metro line. So uh, to make a long story short, uh, the first part of the book looks uh, at Sao Paulo through eight different lenses, a hydrology, grids and grains, uh, uh, vertical growth, mobility, uh, one second. Uh, open space, housing, industry, uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, economic hotspots and their migration over the city. In many ways, creating a larger sort of cartographic set that would then begin to inform a series of transformations uh, in the area that we're talking about. And of course, this is much sort of broader, broadly documented uh, in the book, but just to give you uh, an idea of sort of how sort of this larger research then sort of sets the framework, it establishes a territorial grammar uh, for the, the intervention that we proposed, I'll just sort of explain the project uh, in these three slides. This is the city in uh, 1842, uh, sort of occupying a higher elevation along sort of a free floating plain that was the river. This is the city in 2017, where we actually see the rect what they what is called in Sao Paulo the rectification of the project, uh, putting a stray uh, of the river. Sorry, putting a stray jacket along, sort of the river, and in many ways establishing an extremely utilitarian relationship to the river. The river was never part of the life of the city. It was always utilized in support of something, in support of industry primarily. And then developing a proposal, which here I'm just explaining with one image, but that makes an argument that sort of from a, both a sustainability uh, and public space, uh, sort of from a sustainability standpoint, from a hydrological standpoint, and from an open space perspective, the city needs to establish a new contractual agreement with the river. Uh, and that a river that once upon a time had a very, uh, in many ways, uh, utilitarian or, or almost pornographic relationship with the city. Uh, it was always sort of put to the service, to the use of something, needs to be rethought in terms of a much more romantic relationship with the city. Uh, and in a way, by giving the space back to the river, the city can actually reimagine a new role for the, uh, um, uh, for the river uh, within the city. Uh, this, of course, it is not sort of uh, uh, both the book and the uh, uh, proposal is not a project that is going to be built tomorrow, but it is actually a project that both through the drawings, through the mappings, but also so through the design strategies is meant to ignite the imagination of Paulistas. Uh, and on the one hand, it's meant to open a conversation about the transformation of the river, but on the other, it's meant to sort of showcase not just the challenges, but the many lessons that Sao Paulo as a city offers across the world. Uh, and I always like to show these two uh, images, sort of a, a, a project in one of the main pages of uh, Foja, uh, the Sao Paulo, one of the main newspapers uh, in the city, but also uh, the way the work has actually circulated through many different exhibitions, in this case, uh, as part of an exhibition that just opened in the Seoul City Hall in uh, South Korea about sort of uh, urban best practices uh, uh, across the world. Uh, and I'll finish uh, with this image of uh, um, uh, the exhibition we opened at Escola da Cidade in uh, uh, Sao Paulo and sort of looking forward to uh, an exciting conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Felipe. Great timing. <laughs> uh, now, Dr. Kenneth Thomas, we open the floor for you. Very good. Um, so I need to, if I may, uh, share yes. a screen. Um, yes, you should be able to. All right. Um, let's see how I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this, and then I'm going to do this, and I'm going uh oh, do this. Okay. <laughs> Um, 
full so, screen do you want to put? Um, am I sharing a screen? I'm not yet sharing a screen. Let me just. Uh, um, it's not full screen. Yeah, you should go into present mode. Uh, not slideshow mode. Let's see. Um, I'm sorry. Yeah, so, if you go slideshow, Kendall. Slideshow. Slideshow, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm there. Play we from are. start. There we go. Okay. All right. Perfect. All right. So um, I'm. I'm. I must confess. I. 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 I don't really know what my charge was. I agreed to do this, um, as I said at the beginning of um, the evening, because uh, Laura Kurgan had been invited to moderate. And she and I had been engaging in a number of conversations about possible collaborations. And I thought this might be an opportunity uh, publicly to jumpstart some of uh, that conversation. So um, I, I, I must confess, I don't know uh, whether I was um, charged to talk about Latin America uh, or uh, whether I can talk about something else. So this is the moderators or the the panel organizer's worst nightmare, uh, because I'm going to talk about what I want to talk about, um, which is um, a, a set of observations organized under the rubric of uh, the development of underdevelopment, race, rezoning, and the right to the city. And um, the Latin American city that I'm going to talk about is New York, um, because um, the um, uh, the fact of the matter is, and I'm not saying anything that uh, we don't already know, is that New York is part of, um, is a crossroads for several diasporas. Uh, and the neighborhood in which I live, Harlem, um, is certainly uh, one of the central nodes um, of the, the Treftpunkt or Treftpunkt for uh, many different cultures, global cultures. So I want to, um, frame my remarks with an observation that's inspired by the preface of Richard Rothstein's 2017 book, The Color of Law, A Forgotten History of How Our Government Segregated uh, America. Rothstein points out uh, two of the many euphemisms we Americans have coined, quote, so that polite company doesn't have to confront our history of racial exclusion, unquote. He writes, quote, when we consider problems that arise when African-Americans are absent in significant numbers from schools that whites attend, uh, we say we seek diversity, not racial integration. When we wish to pretend that the nation did not single out African-Americans in a system of segregation specifically aimed at them, um, we define them as just another people of color. So I think it's important to, to highlight uh, the ways we talk about uh, specifically uh, my subject, which is uh, zoning and zoning law. Uh, because I think if we, if, we, if we use the language of zoning to describe uh, the radical transformation of the racial geography, the racial and ethnic geography of New York City, uh, we in effect do uh, similar semantic work of the kind that deracialized terms uh, like diversity or de, 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 de black in terms uh, like people of color do uh, in capturing the specificity um, of the uses of uh, state power as a mechanism of uh, a politics of racial geography which is about exclusion, right? So um, I want to say as a threshold matter uh, that zoning for me um, understood as a racial project um, is a crucial uh, 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 tool or technology, uh, legal tool or technology um, in US racial capitalism. So. Um, the U.S. state itself, uh, uh, like the U.S. state itself, uh, American law and American political economy are, in the words of the scholars Michael Omi and Howard Winant, racial formations. 
uh, racial meanings, and here I'm quoting them, uh, pervade US society, extending from the shaping of individual racial identities to the structuring of collective political action within government institutions, as well as society. So it's obvious once said that the, the American state at both the national, uh, state, and local levels is a racial state, uh, and that American capitalism is a racial capitalism. And, and zoning law, zoning policy, my subject, really sits at the nexus of the racial state and of racial capitalism. Um, because to use a term coined by my colleague uh, at Columbia Law School, Katerina Pistor, uh, US law and US capitalism both codify race. So I wanna say a few words about um, New York zoning law and uh, specifically a policy that has codified race and which uh, uses law to advance uh, the interests of racial capitalism. And I, I've stressed the racial uh, dimensions and determinants of US law and capitalism because I, I believe the time has come to abandon once and for all the idea uh, that what we lawyers call racial discrimination is a discrete, insular, episodic, or aberrant subversion of an otherwise colorblind, race neutral, legal, political, and economic order. To the contrary, um, consider the street rebellions against police violence that took place um, in the streets of our country uh, starting over the summer and which have continued. Now, for those who are willing to listen, the protests organized by the Movement for Black Lives and others provide a national seminar on the foundational role that institutional and structural racism have played in shaping policing and police policy. Uh, the target of the national movement to end the police beating and shooting of African-Americans and Latinx uh, um, residents of cities uh, and towns all over the country is not just a few dirty cops or a few uh, bad police departments. The movement- and Kendall, oh, can, I, yeah. can I ask you a question? Yeah. Are your slides, are you just speaking to one slide or have I'm you just speaking to speaking one, to one. Great, great, okay. Uh, the well, movement that's what I thought. Yeah. understands that the problem is not merely punitive policing, but rather what we constitutional lawyers call the police power itself uh, and the police power state. Um, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna exit um, the formal, oops, this won't work. Uh, no, I'm gonna exit. Yeah, I'm gonna exit. So now can you, uh, let me just stop the sharing um, so you can see me, right? Um, the, the Movement for Black Lives understands that the problem is not merely punitive policing, but rather what we constitutional lawyers call the police power itself. Uh, and the police power state, which from its inception has made the violent taking of black and brown life, of black and brown property. Uh, for those of you who've been watching um, Lovecraft Country and the story it told in the last episode uh, on Sunday of the Tulsa riots and the theft of black property. Um, the movement for black lives understands that the police power and the police state uh, has made the violent taking of black and brown life part of the essential work of policing in America. So the demand of the movement in short is not merely to stop discriminating on the basis of race to, to quote Chief Justice Roberts, but to dismantle the legal, political and economic regime of racial domination. Now in the 1847 license cases, Chief Justice Taney offered a description of the police power uh, that is still valid. The police power Taney wrote is quote, the power of sovereignty, the power to govern men and things within the limits of its dominion. So in my remaining minutes, I wanted to consider a use of um, the, a putatively race neutral police power here in New York, uh, which is not um, a withdrawal so much as a redistribution of economic power and resources through the tax system, zoning law and housing policy. New York's 421 abatement and subsidy pro, uh, program. Um, I want to say in brief that while the 421A policy, which is a city policy, and the regime of zoning uh, of which it is a part, was packaged and sold as a way to develop house, housing and wealth 
in the city's black and brown communities, it was anything but. Indeed, the story of the 421A program in New York is a story of the ways in which formally colorblind development policies um, are used as a, a tool uh, and the use of the police power uh, has been used to underdevelop the welfare and well-being of black and brown communities. Now the 421A program was basically, is basically a story about neoliberal public and private partnerships in which the city in effect um, allowed the most powerful political and economic uh, block in the city, namely private real estate developers uh, to rewrite uh, and reorder the priorities of the city with respect to housing citizens and uh, to in effect hijack what might have been a city policy of building public housing, uh, affordable public housing by instead uh, developing private uh, real estate, private housing uh, under a policy that required uh, private real estate developers to allocate 20% of projects or to build um, uh, additional public housing offsite in exchange for tax subsidies of, um, uh, uh, of real estate uh, projects that built private housing. So I am talking to you from one of those buildings uh, in Harlem. I live in a building uh, <laughs> that was built as a condominium which set aside 20% of the units to be sold uh, below market, right? I'm in a market rate unit, but there were several of the units, a, a small number of units, 20%, several of the units which are sold below market, although they weren't truly affordable, right? Uh, and this was a, a deal, right? That the city reached with private real estate developers. Um, so this 80-20 formula has changed the racial geography of the city. I very often talk um, to communicate this about a film uh, by uh, John Sayles. It's a feature length film called The Brother from Another Planet. Uh, and it tells a story of um, an alien who comes from another planet who looks phenotypically black, played by the actor Joe Morton. And uh, he comes to New York City and there's a scene in the film uh, on the old subway, which most of you are too young to remember, where uh, there's a guy hustling on the train who says to this alien from another planet, uh, played by the actor Joe Morton, you wanna see a trick? I can show you a trick. He says, when we get to the next subway stop, I'm gonna make all the white people get off the bus, uh, off the train. And when the train gets to uh, 96th Street, all the white people leave uh, the subway and it's um, only black and Latino and Latina passengers remain. That was the New York City I arrived at in 1983 when I came to New York. Um, you simply uh, did not see white people traveling into Harlem or into the Bronx on the 2-3 train line. Um, or they would have gotten off at 59th Street on the A train. So the, the, the racial geography of the city uh, was actually uh, part of the material culture of our transportation system. Um, but the racial geography of the city, as you all know, has changed. Uh, it has changed uh, radically. So uh, New York's 421A tax incentive and subsidy scheme and the use by New York of the sovereign uh, police power, which are part of our federalism, uh, which is the way our political system is structured to allocate power between the national and state governments. Um, it seems to me uh, that the 421A tax uh, policy is one uh, that offers us an example of how zoning policy and zoning decisions have been used uh, to perpetuate a colorblind regime of racial sovereignty and of racial dominion, but it's one that is secreted in the interstices of a colorblind deployment of 
the zoning and taxing power. The 421A tax abatement lowers the taxes of real estate developers who have built real estate uh, under the guise of providing housing to people who otherwise would not have it. Um, but the tax scheme, like all taxing policy, is redistributive, right? So what is in effect happen in making the decision to, to, to do this through private rather than public means is a massive redistribution of uh, public wealth upward, right? From the poor uh, to uh, the rich. As one commentator has noted, although the policy was sold um, as a policy that would promote the creation of affordable public housing by private developers, it quote, perpetuated a giveaway of public funds that could otherwise have been collected from private developers and then used to build public housing, right? Um, not only, uh, so the proponents of the 421A tax transfer scheme promised that it would provide decent shelter and promote wealth creation in low income communities because people could buy apartments below market rate and build wealth. Um, moreover, they claimed um, in a typical neoliberal argument that it would achieve a more efficient allocation of public funds. In many parts of the city, such as Harlem, where I live, the public uh, subsidy to private real estate developers led to a precipitous decline in the black and brown population in what had historically been black and brown neighborhoods. So the program, in the words of, uh, of one book, zoned out and displaced the very black and brown New Yorkers whose welfare and well being it was supposed to serve. So Harlem, the historically uh, black New York neighborhood in which I live and where Columbia is located, um, is now predominantly white uh, because of the government subsidized but market driven dislocation and exclusion of community uh, communities of color. So my point in short is that the 421H uh, tax transfer program highlights the paradox of colorblind law and policy and reveals the underlying truth of racial capitalism that my late uh, colleague, Manning Marable, um, um, underscored in his observation that the most striking fact um, about American economic history and politics is the brutal and systematic underdevelopment of black people. Um, Manning um, um, Marable pointed out to us the ways in which that underdevelopment is not an aberration, but has been baked into both our political system and our democratic government and the uh, processes of policymaking that produce policies under the guise of zoning, like the 421A tax abatement. Uh, and it is baked into our so-called free enterprise system, our capitalist system, which is a system of racial capitalism that is structured deliberately and specifically to maximize black and I would add brown oppression. So capitalist development has occurred not in spite of the exclusion of black people and brown people, but because of the brutal exploitation of Blacks as workers and consumers. And we have seen this during the COVID pandemic in which Black um, and Brown workers, predominantly or disproportionately women, um, have been essential workers, right? Uh, yeah, I'm about to wrap up, leading inessential uh, lives. So by calling attention to economic development, law and policy as a racial politics of underdevelopment, my aim has been to show um, or to suggest the ways um, in which development, development po policy, here zoning, can and must be seen uh, for what it is, a continuation of racial segregation, domination and dominion by colorblind means. Um, sorry to have gone on for so long, but I'm not sure I was told I'd have 10 minutes. In fact, I wasn't even <laughs> told that I'd have to present. I thought this was gonna be a conversation uh, so let's have a conversation. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. That was great, everyone. Thank you. Um, 
So it's, it's, uh, it's, it's hard to know where to start because the presentations um, were, so, were so different. Um, but I'm going to, but I, I, I think Kendall, it was great to bring the, um, the focus back, um, back to New York and through a legal and zoning um, order, which, um, which really relates to the map, you know, to the map of the city, which also is, um, is a tool, you know, ha also has historically been a tool of dispossession and segregation um, throughout, right? Throughout the, throughout the history of, 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 New York, of New York City. So what's interesting um, is that you didn't talk about it in terms of a map at all, but the zoning, um, the effects of the zoning were, um, were as active as Felipe um, and Regner were, were asking for in, in, in some ways, right? So whereas Felipe was talking about Sao Paulo and um, the industrialization of the, of the river, and you were talking about it in such physical terms, but those things had to have been zoned in the first place, right? So the, the that is a, you know that happens through zoning where all the industry is on the river and extracting things um, from from the river. But um, and then you you you're trying to produce an imagination through rethinking it through the very same maps that. That um, that caused it to be so polluted and right the the way the way it is now, um, in the same way that Kendall is talking about these um, these racialized tools, um, which seem to create some form of of uh, racial segregation and then do uh, racial integration and do the exact opposite, and you know um, Kendall those those zoning um, orders, they were supposed to, um, like your building, be in the same building. But often what happened was that a developer would build a building um, in Midtown and then negotiate for that 20% to be in the Bronx or you know, further east um, in, Har in, in Harlem and things like that. So terrible tricks were played with the developers with that, um, with that particular law. Um, and Regner, I really love your project. Um, and it's interesting how you make the, the maps um, so physical. <laughs> I don't understand. I never, I never, never go, never go that route. But I'm wondering if you've seen the project querying the city. Have you seen the, the map called querying, querying the city where people write in their own experience, first experience of, um, of being gay or whatever, you know, it's yeah. yeah. Querying the map. Querying the map, yeah. It's called querying, querying yeah. the map, and it's the same thing, like using the space of um, really the space of invisibilization and of in, you know, where you where um, right where you were calling it a dynamic space in Puerto Rico because things were moving around, um, yeah. so you don't really want to map it. Right, so I was just curious why, maybe I can start, I, I, I can ask each one of you a question, but just start there, why you've gone to cartography in the first place where you're kind of fighting against its effects. And I think all three of you are fighting against the effects of, of, um, of cartography and producing a kind of counter narrative, but um, so. It's a way yes. of bringing all those three things together. I'm not sure how effectively, but we can start there and, and have a conversation. Well, Puerto Rico is a very interesting island because it's very small. It's only 35 miles by 100 miles, mm -hmm. but it's very fragmented in terms of community. It's very dependent on the car, for instance, and it doesn't really have a lot of urban life. San Juan is probably the most city-like of all the cities in, in Puerto Rico. But we are a very fragmented community. When I speak, speak about community, I'm talking about the LGBTQ community. I think that um, if we are not 
located and marked in space, it's very easy to dismiss us. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is something common, not just for LGBTQ people, but all minorities. It's a really easy way to dismiss an entire group of people. So mm -hmm. architecture here has been largely responsible for that. The spaces right. of the LGBTQ community. But it's, it's community. interesting because because Kendall is saying the you know the precise opposite that the maps are used to describe you know to racialize and discriminate. So you're wanting those same tools to to reveal and to expose. Is that and to connect? Is that but fair also to say to connect? Yeah. Yes, I don't think that that it's about wanting to use the map to want to look like any other form of mapping. I think that particularly what I'm trying to do with Critopia is to map things that aren't usually mapped. So mm -hmm. for instance, pleasure and joy and safety, um, mm -hmm. which are something that's so important to the queer community. Um, but I think that oh, I, it's very, I think Politics are, it, it, it is largely responsible here. We're living in an island where still today we have really religious groups of people trying to take control of the governorship and of politics. And they want to other the LGBTQ community even more. I think that the map would serve as a tool, as, as a political artifact where we can locate ourselves and make ourselves known. Um, and I don't know how yet, but I think that that's what I'm attempting to do to Queertopia is to use it as a tool for political future, for reclaiming of space, because I think people think that there's, that we're not um, worthy of space or that we don't deserve the right to the city. Mm -hmm. That it's very easy to be disposed of. Yeah, okay. Kendall or Felipe, do you have a response to that? Um, well, I, I, I was um, intrigued by, and I should have made the point um, that my, my intervention really is um, a kind of genealogy of, yeah. of, of mapping, which yeah. is to say, um, as Laura observed, um, that the zoning and planning decisions are um, a condition of possibility, right? And and uh, uh, or prolegomenon to uh, mapping uh, that occurs later, but the actual redrawing, right, of the city landscape takes place uh, through zoning uh, and planning. And so, in in the Harlem uh, case, between two thousand and twenty uh, thirteen the um, population of Harlem grew by 18%. Uh, there was a net loss of 5% in the uh, numbers of black residents in Harlem and a net loss of 13% in the numbers of Latinx uh, Harlem residents. There was a 455% growth uh, in the number of white residents. In <laughs> And so um, Harlem is now majority white. It is, um, to use a phrase of Elijah Anderson, um, a white space, right? Um, and so spatialization, um, uh, the politics of spatialization uh, through um, zoning uh, and planning, right? Uh, precedes the, the mapping of those spaces. Uh, and I wanna suggest that, you know, maps are maps of race and they're maps of political economy, notwithstanding the fact, the fact that um, professional planners um, are typically taught to see uh, zoning law and the exercise of the police power of which zoning law is a part as race neutral. Right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and the essential point that I wanna make um, is that these spaces become racialized and then map neutrally. I mean, I, I don't, I don't, I don't, uh -huh. I've never seen a map, a racial map um, of Harlem uh, that would represent, right? Because maps are, that's what maps are, they're representations mm -hmm. that would represent the spatial injustice uh, that has led to 
uh, the whitening right, uh, of Harlem uh, and the divestment uh, or the investment in, 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 in white residents, a subsidy to white residents that has made the displacement of black and brown Harlem residents possible. Mm. Okay. Um, I see my colleague Leah Meisterlin over here, and I know that they um, that they assigned um, the color of law to all the planning students um, this semester in response to our black faculty um, asking us to unlearn whiteness and to you know to deal with anti-racism in the school. So I'm just curious, Leah, can I put you on the spot in? I know oh, you'll have an opinion about what Kendall is saying as a mapper and planner. Yeah. yeah on both of those things, um, for better and for worse. Um, you know, Laura, you can always put me on the spot. Laura said we, we did um, ask as part of summer reading for all of our incoming Masters of Planning students this year uh, to read The Color of Law so that we could use this, use it as a starting point. Um, for discussions, both during orientation, but also through the semester. I think it's been extremely valuable as a way of um, starting, uh, especially with first years, starting to um, not only, uh, not only starting a, a discussion on um, the racial violence that is involved in policy and the histories of planning it's, it, that we're implicated in and imbricated within, right? Um, but also to talk about the various devices of our discipline, uh, of the spatial disciplines more broadly, whether that's policy making, whether that's cartographic practices and technologies, um, whether that's social science sort of data collection. And I apologize, a different computer just started up and you might've heard that. Um, <laughs> And, and to, to be able to, to challenge sort of, um, we'll say not only dominant, but dominant and white narratives of the history of the profession and the professions of the built environment. So I found that to be really useful thus far. Um, specifically, Kendall, I thought, you, I thought your comments, I don't know, I hadn't formulated a question before I was put on the spot. So I just have some responses and reactions, honestly, to these amazing presentations. That's fine, yeah. Um, but, Kendall, I think I will, I will probably remember for the rest of my life one phrase you used um, <laughs> when, you, when you described the kind of racialized outcomes that, um, that are often, or uh, yeah, that are often sort of either excused, dismissed, or you know, um, condescendingly lamented as unintended consequences, or even worse, like externalities as secreted from the interstices of the policy themselves, right? That we don't need to actually read between the lines of, in order to predict uh, the impacts uh, and disparate or disproportional impacts on some communities over others or the, um, because they're baked in, right? They're not only baked in, those, those, those futures that these policies will create are bleeding from the page. And <laughs> um, in, in, it's been a long day, so my, my language gets a little bit more colorful as the night goes on. Um, or, you know, like they really are, they're just bleeding from the page um, from these uh, sort of um, predictable uh, acts of not only discrimination, but I'm gonna say spatial and economic and experiential violence. And the map ends up being a device and a tool for this in ways that are deeply troubling. But like Regner and, and your work and your explorations um, at the moment, um, I, I get, I get why you've been brought into the cartography because it seems like you're trying to not only understand but hijack and exploit the kind of uh, the, the 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 assumed authority and uh, legitimacy of the map as the document of spatial record, right? Mm -hmm. So that you can you can like if inserting and asserting and demanding a place within that record by drawing one's community and oneself into spaces and means asserting that presence and that experience into history. Um, and I find that uh, deeply moving um, and, and reassuring in many ways. And I'm so glad to see how many of our students are here with us and recent grads as well yeah, to hear exactly. all of us. Yeah. Yeah, Laura. Pauline, I can also see, I can see there's so many, who was that? 
Uh, it's me, it's Anna. Yeah. Laura, there's okay. um, a couple of interesting questions in the in chat. The, yeah, I was just yeah. I was just reading all of these all of these things. And Pauline Pauline was in my Puerto Rico seminar. We actually um, uh, Regner, we have to show you all the maps we made um, of Puerto Rico and the same. You know, we really sort of looked at the whole history of the island and its various. Uh, colonizations and uh, destructions and them. yeah yeah so um, Pauline particularly uh, did some amazing some amazing work but what are you saying over here um, Pauline do you want to ask your question and we also have to um, uh, talk to Felipe as well um, sure yeah. no problem Laura over yeah. here and also, Where are you? hi oh, Tyreen hi also here. nice we to see you together. yeah yeah, yeah. So it's kind of a broad question actually for both. Uh, yeah. Do you see any risk or biases related to maps and visualizations that you have produced for Puerto Rico and uh, Sao Paulo? And if so, could you please expand on what's your approach? Uh, yeah. Yeah, maybe Felipe, yeah. Uh, I, I can start sort of yeah. with that. Uh, and I think uh, in many ways, uh, the answer is yes. It, mapping is never neutral, right? Uh, and uh, specifically in our work, it, we generally sort of examine cities uh, from a perspective that's inherently uh, sort of e extremely sort of attached to the discipline of architecture, right? To the, to the larger sort of history of how architects have drawn cities. Uh, and within that, you actually have certain uh, biases and certain uh, uh, sort of and give preference to certain things versus others. But I think what's important about sort of uh, uh, this process is that sort of uh, despite the approach, it actually allows us to visualize sort of conditions in the city that otherwise would not be visible to the naked eye uh, and therefore allows sort of a very different kind of discussion to, uh, uh, to start in the sort of it bringing a much larger set of audiences uh, to the table. So for example, it, as we were uh, actually developing one of the research lines, for us, one of the most interesting uh, sort of narratives that came out of the mapping project uh, or the mapping component of the project had to do, for example, that this area that sort of by the, the sort of uh, municipal standards has been deemed as entirely post-industrial a, and uh, um, a sort of is in dire need of transformation also has some of the most sort of historically important original workers housing uh, in Sao Paulo. Worker housing that was originally established in relationship to the industry uh, that actually got the lowest uh, uh, sort of uh, land within the floodplain, uh, so it's highly floodable. Uh, and part of this conversation now has sort of began to develop a strategy that's not just about the transformation of this territory, but also about the critical conservations of certain parts and pieces. So uh, in many ways, yes, I think that sort of, uh, at least from our perspective, uh, mapping is always uh, um, in many ways biased. Uh, it has a particular sort of angle to it, uh, but I think it becomes an important tool, uh, not just to sort of visualize certain things, but also to instigate debate and dissent. Uh, and I think that that's where it's, uh, uh, mm -hmm. it's most powerful. Yeah. It's interesting, Felipe, because you never um, do maps in a GIS way. As far as I've seen your maps, they're um, very based in, um, in you know, landscape and physical, uh, uh, physical instantiation of things. And, so I'm just, I'm curious why, you know, cause I thought that was very powerful what, what Kendall said that things are racialized and then mapped neutrally. Do you ever, um, why yeah. do you never go uh, the data? Never, look, we look at- <laughs> yeah. uh, it's, inter it's just, it's interesting. Uh, no, yeah. I think we actually look at a lot of data. Uh, yeah. it, for us, it's very important that sort of the work that we develop uh, goes beyond the collection of data uh, yeah. and actually begins to reveal certain physical, sort of certain social, cultural, and economic perspectives uh -huh. from the vantage point of urban form. Of the form, right. right. That's so, what, yeah, yeah. So for example, a, one of the 
the issues that for us was very important once again in Sao Paulo is to begin to map sort of distribution of land in relationship to topography and who actually got access to that land. Uh, and you begin to see that the areas that are today sort of most uh, uh, prone to flooding uh, uh, because of sort of the larger sort of straight jacket that was put on the river also begin to coincide with sort of all the land that sort of immigrants uh, uh, from the 40s, 50s and 60s, uh, primarily uh, uh, right. Italian and later Japanese, Sort of occupied. So I think that all of these layers are uncovered in the drawings, mm -hmm. it, but we uh, attempt in many ways to be uh, perhaps a, a sort of more, more open from a perspective of urban form. Of the op open-ended in the yeah. in the interpretive nature right. of the of the. You did the same in New Orleans as well with that. That was right. the first time I saw right. that kind of work that you that you did. Okay. Um, any other questions from? Um, question received. Inea um, has a question. Yeah. Okay. Who's that? Yeah. Inea, you muted. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, hi. Hi. Um, so basically, I realized in all three examples that the relationship between the author of the map and what they're trying to either expose or conceal um, in some examples, racial zoning laws and concealing the reality behind um, the actual intention behind these divisions and other parts um, revealing um, to what a lot of the population is invisible queer spaces um, and giving them their own space. So this relationship between author and the manifestation of these non-physical things in a very graphic visual form I'm sort of interested in commenting if, um, like, in the way that maps do create alterity in deciding who the map is for and who the map is made by. Um, and just wondering if any of uh, the speakers have any advice about what us as architecture students, being people who make a lot of maps, should <laughs> um, maybe unlearn or keep in mind when we're producing these new maps. Um, yeah. So, yeah. It's a very good question. I mean, I would just sort of answer this briefly in that I think that there is one, an overproduction of maps in, uh, in mapping in architecture school. Uh, it's something that has become sort of, a, a, that has permeated sort of a, a all curriculums. Uh, and in many ways, I think there's a, a, a need to be able to sort of uh, create, I think, a more rigorous sort of, uh, taxonomy and overlook at what are all of these sort of uh, uh, mapping exercises doing. Uh, and I think for me, the uh, uh, a, sort of the, the main answer to your question is uh, that I think you should be less concerned with what is the map that you're doing uh, and more concerned with what are the larger ideas that you want to push forward. Uh, and then ask yourself if sort of mapping or drawing, what medium is or set of, of media becomes sort of the most appropriate way to advance that question. Uh, but I think for me, the, the, the key question is always sort of, uh, sort of checking or double checking sort of the, the technique and sort of consistently with a larger sort of a, a set of ideals that you might have set forward. Uh, and I think we do see today a lot of uh, mapping for the sake of mapping. Mm. Yeah, I think it's a it's 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 such a complicated um, question because in architecture school, as a professional school, you learn certain tools. Um, you know, we you go off and you work in offices and you work in plan and section and perspective and you use maps and you do this right. So um, when you're when you're in the process of trying to do things in a in a different way. Uh, to produce different effects, right, in, in your work, um, you, you, you have, you, you know, you can't sort of start from scratch. Um, so you're always sort of looking at the limits of tools and the biases and the, the constraints of them. 
and also you know trying to use them in 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 new ways to undo their effects so that's i think what the counter counter cartography might mean but i don't know what that means in terms of architectural representation you know like the axonometric there's so many kendall you won't understand this because you're not in architecture school but you know you walk around the studio and when I was in architecture school, um, axonometrics were completely prevalent and then they stopped. Like nobody drew axonometrics. Now they're rampant everywhere in the school and they have a military orange. Um, you know, they, they were designed to, to you know, show a missile going over a wall of, a, of an old city for, on the one hand and on the other hand, they were used for engineering, you know, to show three different sides at one time. And hardly anybody thinks, oh, what's the history of an axonometric? But most people think, what is the history of a map? And that a map has always been used as a, you know, as a, as a tool of control. Um, but you don't think of that in terms of the drawing technique. So I like to think of them all together, um, but I don't, I don't have any answers right now. <laughs> But it is. You I think know, it's so. a very interesting question that you're asking, Inia. And mm -hmm. following up on something that Felipe said at the end of his presentation, when he mentioned that um, these maps were intended to spark debate and conversation and confrontation, mm -hmm. I think that one thing that, yeah. that one thing that um, that is important is to recognize that the way that architecture students are taught to represent maps is a way is a system of representation that is legible mostly to people who study architecture. So if you open up these maps to people who are not um, trained in an architecture school, they are not going to understand it in the same way. So what you present and how you present it, I think one thing to, to keep in mind is who your audience is intended to be. And I'm, I've been doing a bit of research on what Puerto Rican maps used to look like before. So to help me in, like make decisions on the design of Queertopia, and I can't get the image of, if you think on Puerto Rican restaurants, which I'm sure that you've been to, there's these placemats that have these very kind of cartoon-like maps, which um, caricaturize certain important points in the island or certain things where different municipalities are known for. And that's a system of representation that's intended for, architects might think it's, it's kind of um, basic or, or cartoon-like, but people who are not architects understand this system of representation. And in that way, it's very powerful for them because they're visualizing things with the worldview that they are and the vocabulary that they already have at their disposal. So I think that we are very trained to do things and, and represent things in a particular way, but that does exclude a lot of the people that will see these maps. Can I jump in as someone um, who's not a professional architect, uh, but who I think can, can make an observation by way of analogy, because I teach um, students who are becoming uh, professionals, professional uh, lawyers. And what I would say is that um, what I say to my students is equally true of um, architects. That is to say, um, you have to rep understand that your, your professional practice is embedded in a network of power relations, right? Um, and that um, therefore uh, mapping is never uh, only or even primarily uh, a mere technical exercise, but it is a technology, um, a, a, a mode of representation uh, that is either um, advancing uh, or contesting uh, relations of power. Many years ago, I was in Chicago at, um, it was an art show. It was actually, um, it's the first time I saw the paintings of uh, Leon Gallup. And there was another exhibit and um, they use words. And, and there was this quotation, which I've never forgotten, which is uh, that the map is not the territory and the name of the thing is not the thing itself. And uh, I thought of that, um, uh, a few years ago, the first time I went to Rio de Janeiro, I had this map and I was standing um, in Ipanema uh, on the beach, no, in, in Le Blanc uh, on the beach with a map. Um, and on the map, there was this huge area 
which had been rendered green and unpopulated. But when I looked up, I saw all these buildings and, and lights. Mm. Uh, and I found out later that it was the favela of Vigi, uh, Vigigal, um, where you know tens of thousands of people live, right? But the, the map as a practice of power rendered those people invisible. And so maps are regimes of uh, visibilization or of invisibilization, right? Um, and maps are ideological, right? Uh, so I just often hear the famous um, insight of Lou Altizer about ideology. Ideology represents, he says, the imaginary relationship of individuals to their material conditions of existence. So maps are an, are an imaginary domain, both a site and a vehicle of power in much the same way that law is. Um, and so I would just urge a critical cultivation of the consciousness of um, the ways in which your professional practice is always already implicated in networks of power that you can't escape, um, but that you have to figure out uh, ways to navigate. Thank you. Okay. I have a shameless plug here. Um, Go for it. So, okay, shameless plug, captive audience of architecture students. Um, luckily at GSAP, right, there's the undercurrent it's not an undercurrent, it's a, it's a rocket ship of underpinning most of the cartographic oriented visual studies and seminars, visual studies courses and seminars. Um, and so if, if this is a direction in which you find your own um, like toolkit moving in or your own interest in research methods and spatial research methods, um, the sort of premises of critical cartography um, I know are threaded through all of Laura's courses. Um, and the shameless part is that I also know they're in mine. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, but, totally fine. Yeah, but, no, um, we, but there, yeah. There's, a, there's a wealth of, of really hard conversations about um, mapping practices specifically. And then of course there's the, there's the relationship between the map as a drawing and the plan as a drawing. Although they share a projective kind of similarity um, they are they are different in how they're read, but um, there's 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 a lot of conversations that can be had, and I'm just I'm excited to see that you guys have organized this conversation. I'll stop talking now. Yeah, no, and I think the what's great about the way that they curated the the speakers, you know, starting from a very personal mapping exercise, which um, that Regner's uh, project, which then exposes you know all kinds of politics of visibility and invisibility to Felipe's work, which starts with a formal, you know, rendering or formal, um, you know, analysis of a city, but then opens up all kinds of new imaginations of what's possible later on to Kendall's, you know, non-mapping, you know, it's, it's not a mapping, but starting with a legal term and then showing how that really activates all kinds of geographies and inequalities and spatialities, you know, they, it was very, very um, well curated. So, you know, I don't know who did, who did that, but, you know, it sort of brings up a whole range of, um, of methods as well that you should all keep in mind as you move forward if you're still, if you're interested in these types of things. So. Any other questions? Where are we? We're almost at nine. Maybe yes. one one final question. Um, mm -hmm. Given the, this is a question we received, given the increasing silos and isolation in which we find ah. ourselves in everyday life, how can we ensure that a panel like this one with researchers, lawmakers, and practitioners working through critical analysis can take place 20 years from now, digital platforms yeah. aside? Uh, maybe I'll start by, uh, I don't, I'm not sure if we can guarantee anything 20 years by now, <laughs> uh, way, uh, things are going. But uh, uh, one thing that I will say, uh, uh, and what I actually find very productive uh, about sort of these kind of dialogues, uh, is that sort of by not 
necessarily blurring distinctions across disciplines, but by finding moments of overlap, I think professionals from all disciplines are in a much better position to actually engage uh, questions of much greater complexity within the built environment. Uh, and uh, uh, in that way, I think sort of uh, uh, as architects, uh, uh, as landscape architects, as planners, it, we need to continue sort of uh, expanding uh, the toolkit of the discipline, which had, in many moments is going to involve not necessarily becoming an expert at another discipline, but having enough knowledge to be able to establish those conversations. Uh, so for example, uh, tonight I'm uh, uh, actually fascinated, uh, Kendall, about your uh, uh, sort of presentation uh, on uh, sort of inclusionary zoning, right? And uh, 421H, uh, uh, where I think sort of the perspective of how sort of law shapes the built environment and its affinities to architecture uh, and design are actually uh, um, a, a sort of quite productive. And in fact, maybe I'll, I'll finish this uh, uh, with a question for Kendall, if I can, uh, which is that I'm in complete agreement that sort of inclusionary zoning has sort of failed, uh, not, 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 not only sort of from a racial perspective, but even from sort of a, a basic perspective of providing affordable no housing in the numbers that it should actually provide. It, from sort of my vantage point, revisiting a new model of municipal housing would be an interesting avenue. And I would want to hear from the perspective of sort of a, um, a land use law uh, and implementation, what do you think are the alternatives to, uh, uh, to the model we have right now in New York City? That's a great question. Um, uh, you know, I mean, I, clearly, uh, I think these decisions um, about basic goods, like where hospitals are cited, where schools are cited, what 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 sorts of resources are provided to schools. Uh, this was all the stuff that people were in the streets about, right? So the the defund the police, the call to defund the police, uh, and I always add to refund the people, uh, was a call for distributive justice, right? So you know, I think you know, in the broadest um, terms. We need to reimagine uh, what the right to the city uh, means in ways that take questions of distributive justice uh, seriously, which is very hard to do in this uh, age of radical inequality, right? Um, and so I, I think in the first instance, um, we need to advance a vision of decisions about the built environment as decisions that should not be uh, controlled presumptively um, and exclusively uh, by markets, right? Uh, but our question of democratic decision-making in a way uh, that they've certainly not been in New York um, and which I imagine they haven't been in, in other cities. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, it's, it's for me, uh, in the first instance, a question of, of reimagining what um, the spaces of democracy uh, and, and democratic uh, justice should look like and what um, the claims of spatial justice as a democratic ideal are for specific decisions about uh, housing and the built environment more generally, where parks are, uh, where hospitals are, where schools are and what they look like, uh, where jails are, for goodness sake, um, where um, uh, polluting uh, uh, or, or pollution processing plants are. There are a whole host of decisions that have simply been taken off the agenda of democratic decision-making um, that um, need to be put back on. Can I add, Can I add one, one thing, thing to that question? question? Oh my God, I hear myself. Yeah, I hear um, yeah. uh, just reacting to this question that Luis Miguel posted, um, I think that one thing that's really important is to acknowledge that maybe one thing that makes this viable is to have more architecture students working within public policy, working within politics, working within education, not just going towards the traditional route of architectural practice. 
For example, in my teaching, I always make a point to include non-architects in my crits as judges because they bring a different way to interpret the projects and they bring a different set of experiences and people are calling it the toolkit here. I don't know if that's the same, the same thing that I'm referring to right now, but I hope that bringing those people make my students also appreciate people from other disciplines getting involved in architecture and then when they're practicing or teaching in 20 years, they also establish those interdisciplinary collaborations. So I think that this question about what the future might bring is a lot to do with what you, the students of, of GSAP, of Latin GSAP, are going to do about this. I don't know that it matters so much the platform. I think that these will be conversations that you will have at the dinner table with friends, that you will have at the pub with peers and coworkers. These will be the conversations that you have with partners and that you have with students. Yeah, I think this is a great way to put uh, what we were trying to accomplish with this event is a lot of ask us like how do we uh, decided to reach out to Kendall Thomas because he's usually not uh, someone who's at the GSAP sphere. So mm -hmm. we wanted to give a little shake up in the discourse of architecture that usually keeps uh, uh, having the same narrative. So bringing someone to give a different perspective, I think it was great. And then I would like to thank you, thank everyone. So if Anna wants to give a final statement to close up the event, I'll open the phone for you. Yeah. Um, no, this was great. I just wanna thank everyone. Um, I think, um, you know, we have to keep on pondering the invisible as, um, Kendall said, because um, the invisible is not really invisible, right? It's there. And um, I go back to what I was saying at the beginning. It's interesting being from Brazil, you know, and, and, and having gone through all of what we have gone through the summer um, um, in the streets and, and everywhere else to realize that Americans don't usually know what, uh, what the word alterity means. And that's, I think, why the students um, chose to use this as this kind of like, you know, big um, framework for, for the discussion. Because I think it's, you know, it's, it's really what you guys are doing with all the, the mapping and trying to, the, or, or the language, right, that Kendall was talking about, trying yeah. to, to morph or reformat what we're seeing, right, and how we're seeing it. So thank you so much. Yeah, you, I'm really everyone. glad you brought it back to that to that word. And yeah, thanks so much for organizing this. And I wish I could say I'll see you in Avery, but <laughs> <laughs> we will I'll see some of you on Zoom windows. I can see a few of you. So <laughs> okay. Yes. Thank so you, everyone. Thank you okay. all very much. All right, and invitation. thanks, thanks, uh, Philippe, and. Um, and Regner and Kendall. Yes. Yeah.